No. I'd just like to introduce our, our first speaker for our uh, this evaluation of manure technology session. If this is not the session you want to be, be at, there's the door. <laughs> no, if, well, <laughs> all right. <laughs> well, our, our first speaker for this session is uh, Shannon Banner, and she's a graduate student in biological and agricultural engineering program at NC State. I uh, had an opportunity to meet Shannon a few years ago at North Carolina A&T in Greensboro when she was an undergraduate there. Uh, she's currently pursuing her PhD, PhD degree. Her research focuses on characterizing environmental, economic, and social trade-offs associated with potential adoption of alternative technologies and value-added products related to swine waste management systems. Uh, additional research interest that she has includes the effects of federal and state policies and regulations on, sw excuse me, on swine farm and swine industry operations. Okay, Shannon? Good afternoon. Uh, so what I'm presenting today is actually um, a subset of a larger multidisciplinary collaborative effort um, to determine value from implementing different technologies for spine waste management on farms. But specifically, I'll be talking about sort of phase one of my research, which is understanding the intersection or the interactions between the environmental and economic components related to those technologies. Point, point it at the, at the computer. Oh. Yeah. Okay, let me try that again. And also, can you guys hear me okay? Put it up, up on your column. Move it up just a little. No. Just <laughs> pause. Not enough hands. All right, I know. Just Commercial start. break, everyone. Just started to let you know. Is that too low? Is, no, that, is that okay? No, I can't see. Yay! <clears throat> okay. All right. Um, so for this particular uh, research that I'm doing, at least in the beginning trials, I selected certain environmental and economic topics that I thought were important to include. Um, certainly this is not a comprehensive list, but some of the most important ones I thought um, were emissions, specifically greenhouse gas emissions, ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, um, nutrient management related to nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, recovery and application, waste management, I actually left something off, but that would be collection storage treatment and then uh, ultimate utilization. Uh, for this scenario and some subsequent ones I did, just land application. Um, and then economics, and a lot of these you might notice are seem to be smaller scale. I did do sort of farm specific um, simulations, but I'm hoping to scale that up in the future. So uh, capital costs and operating costs, which are um, widely known to be a huge uh, chunk of the economic uh, burden that swine producers face. <coughs> Traditional revenue in the form of animals to market, um, other products and byproducts from animal production, and then in crops, if they are cash crops or value-added crops. And then non-traditional revenue. So renewable energy, carbon credit, uh, organic fertilizer uh, versus mineral fertilizer purchases, things like that. Don't worry. Well, you may just have to push the button. Okay, that's all right too. Okay, um, but to back up a second and not just <coughs> jump right into the issues associated um, with hog production and swine farms. Um, oh, you're not the first one. No, it wasn't me. Okay, <laughs> that's okay. Thank you. Um, I'd like to bring up the concept of ecosystem services, which is the name entails are um, direct and indirect benefits provided by ecosystems. And usually um, these are used in the context of the larger services provided by ecosystems to society, um, broad perspective, but when I started looking at some of the categories, the regulating, cultural, provisioning, and supporting services, um, and looked at it on a farm scale, I realized how many of these were directly related to to the farm scale, and then you know, obviously ripple throughout the industry and, and on larger scales. But you know, climate regulation, pest and disease management, nutrient nutrient recycling, food, fertilizer, and off uh, and not an odd one, I should say, but one that's not often rec 
recognizes the human nature interaction and then customs and traditions. Um, all of these are encompassed in farm systems. And I think that the importance of pointing out ecosystem services is that when we get into valuing things or what things are worth down the line, which I'll um, present later on, is it's important to consider these things and not just dollars. Okay, so the operating realm of animal production. Now I'm going from agriculture sort of down to animal production. Obviously there are interactions in the economic, social, and environmental realms, but where does animal production and farming and these things really fit? Well, sort of in the middle where when people use these diagrams, they like to put the word sustainability. So the connection there is that if this is what sustainability is, or what we like to call sustainability, and this is also the same realm that animal production operates, well then we need to start looking more than just dollars and cents and, and economic parameters uh, to determine what a value uh, of a product or of a system is. So what is sustainability? I actually just did a quick Google search. Um, about 235 synonyms for the word sustainable came up. And that should be an indicator. I think we all heard the term, probably know a couple definitions, but the fact that there are 235 synonyms means we might want to figure out what we're defining it as. And for me, I tried to pull out the ones that really stood out um, related to animal production and farming, which are resilient, self-sufficient, maintainable, feasible, renewable, and durable, and supportable. I think probably most of us can agree that this describes uh, a farming system or a, a you know, a well-operating, well-maintained um, farming system. So if these are what it means and a farming system is categorized by this, then what is value and what is worth? And that gets back to, I have the dollar sign and the question mark because if we agree that farm systems can be or are sustainable and that these are descriptions, then how do we define what those are? So that is the overall question of this research or a larger question of this research that we're trying to aim at is, is how do we determine worth and value? And how do we you know, begin to define and measure values that are appropriate um, for, to reflect changes in, in these systems as we go along with this technology adoption and nutrient management and things like that? So traditional methodologies, when I say methodologies, that's modeling, that's just uh, valuation models, that's the way that traditionally um, researchers and, and other individuals have tried to evaluate farm systems and animal production, among other things. Um, on the economic side, you have input output analysis on the farm level budgeting or partial budgeting, uh, life cycle costing. On the social side, it's um, much less developed, but there's a lot of initiatives towards you know, welfare analysis and well-being, social life cycle assessment. On the environmental side, certainly life cycle assessment has been really prominent. Um, and then also bioeconomic, biophysical modeling and a lot of other models in between. Um, so the issue is that all of these models have challenges and a lot of them are similar challenges. I know you've probably heard the term, all models are wrong, some are useful, that's true. Um, so the point is, to understand the limitations and the benefits of these different models and then maybe to be able to utilize that to find the best combination. Some of the most uh, common challenges are scale, being able to do something on a small scale and then translate that to a larger scale. Um, obviously biological systems are not linear in most cases and that can be difficult. Uh, stakeholders, stakeholders are important but they all generally have different interests. <coughs> okay, but we need to understand that when we're determining what we're modeling and who we're modeling it for and the outcomes. Uh, measured or desired outcomes and metrics that really just goes hand in hand with the stakeholder. Different people have different outcomes, different desires, um, different things that they think are important. Terminology, uh, the example of sustainability I just gave, that's just one word, but imagine trying to model all sorts of complex systems and all the terminology that goes into that. You can use the same word to mean different things or different words to mean the same things. And in reviewing literature, I find many examples of that, even in the same systems. Um, and then understanding and evaluating complex systems. So 
I think that these two are probably the largest challenges faced in modeling. I think if we can understand complex systems a little better or the way that we approach trying to evaluate them, and then also with that in mind, choose the right metrics or the right parameters that fit into that understanding, then probably some of the other issues will be addressed. So, having said that, I chose life cycle, environmental life cycle assessment for the uh, environmental impact assessment of, um, of this research scenario. So, without going into detail, it basically environmental life cycle assessment, um, for those of you who are not familiar, just accounts for all of the environmental impacts associated with a product over the course of its life. Generally, that means from raw material extraction to disposal. And these five <coughs> terms are really the underlying foundation of building a life cycle assessment model. They're fundamental. So a functional unit is what you use to um, sort of define a reference for the entire system. It's a quantitative value. It could be a mass. It could be a volume. And everything else is normalized to that amount. The boundary, probably one of the most important parts of a life cycle assessment, is used sort of as a cutoff can't model the entire world, so you have to pick a piece of it. And that piece of it is bounded um, quantitatively. Mass and energy and everything else is contained within that box, and you don't consider anything outside of that. <coughs> flows, processes, and systems are really just a hierarchy. Flows are all of the environmental, um, technological inputs and outputs to your to your, uh, within your boundary, and then combinations of flows create processes, combinations of processes build systems. So for the scenario that I'm going to be telling you about um, further on in the presentation, these are my overviews and assumptions. We took a representative farm, I actually had on-site farm data for a, a swine finishing farm in Bladen County, North Carolina. Um, that was largely our source of data. And we chose a functional unit based on the function of the system, which is to manage waste. So we chose one ton um, of raw waste as excreted. The reason we chose raw waste was because when introducing alternative technologies, the composition um, and the manure characteristics changed throughout the system. So we needed to start with something that was the same. So the one ton of raw waste as excreted um, from the animal in the barn was our functional unit. The boundary uh, is considered a gate-to-gate -gate assessment, so I did not include everything from digging a hole in the ground to um, the consumer eating the meat. I simply kept it as from the farm gate to entering the farm gate, or sorry, starting at the farm gate, ending at the farm gate. So barn, animals, manure production through land application, nothing else upstream was included and nothing else downstream was included. Um, again, the flows, only materials and, mission, and emissions on the farm. Um, and then ultimately, we ended up having four processes, so four combinations of flows, and that would be representative of waste management, removal, uh, storage, treatment, and land application. Uh, we ended up with seven systems, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about those. And then other assumptions that were important is that this is an existing farm. Um, future scenarios will include options for new farms, but right now we just limited it to farms that are existing um, and typical operations on an existing farm. It was one year of continuous operation. A big assumption were that all products were utilized on site. So this farm is actually sort of a special case where they can, they have the capacity, land capacity to utilize nutrients. So that was a really important consideration. Um, and then feed and housing are identical. So that was an identical for all scenarios. It's probably a little hard to see, but this is the overall decision tree that I used to create um, combinations of scenarios. You can see the existing farm. The options for manure removal were a scraper system and a flush system. Flush system is really typical here, um, combined with an anaerobic lagoon to land application, sort of represents the baseline. <coughs> Um, the alternative option was to add a covered lagoon, or a cover to the lagoon to make it a digester, um, and that represents uh, a second scenario 
And then over here we have the addition of a nutrient recovery technology, which in this case was an ammonia air stripping column for nitrogen recovery. So that, this one branch really represents three different scenarios. And then also for the scraper system, we have it operating to collect whole slurry with a digester, whole slurry with a digester and a, sorry, a nutrient recovery. And then, or we can separate the waste stream into solids and liquids, and then also either use digestion or digestion combined with nutrient recovery. Oops. Okay. Did it? That didn't work, but that's okay. <laughs> so this represents uh, this represents the actually what I was describing is the baseline scenario. This is just another way of looking at it that you can actually see. Um, and then for scenario two, we add the covered lagoon um, digester. Uh, and then lagoon storage land application, and then scenario three would include the nutrient recovery. So out of this, we get seven different scenarios. I explained some of them. Um, for the flush scenario, there are three options, and we see that uh, because it was an existing farm, the lagoon would be utilized either as a cover digester, as storage, or storage and treatment, uh, both. For the above, or for the scraper system, because of the reduced volume um, due to no added water uh, compared to the flush system, we actually used uh, above ground digesters for both of those, and for an economic comparison as well, um, with materials and energy. <coughs> Again, this is just the system boundary showing you um, sort of what I showed before, but in a different view, with the F1, F2, F3 being um, the different flush scenarios. Okay, so as a comparison for the digester systems, um, for overall biogas production potential and net energy, that's net energy um, electricity that was generated um, after you're using it to reheat the digester if you're doing that or any other potential energy sources. So this, uh, the red is obviously the net energy, the blue is the biogas potential from the F2, F3, that would be the covered lagoon digester. And then um, SL1, SL2 is the slurry, the whole slurry um, digested in a tank. And SS1 and SS2 are the scraped solids only digested. And then as far as nitrogen, uh, the nitrogen production is actually just the total amount based on the waste stream and what was generated from any um, added technologies. So F1 is just the amount that you would be able to recover annually from the lagoon. <coughs> the baseline of 95 tons is based on the nitrogen if it was completely conserved as excreted from the animal um, over the course of the, or all animals over the course of the year. And then the red represents the addition of the ammonia stripping column or the ammonia recovery, nitrogen recovery from the ammonia stripper. So relative results, I have these as relative for a few reasons. One. Sorry, I should explain the impact category. I used Tracy. It's an uh, EPA-designed uh, impact calculator. What it does is take all the input and output flows, pick out the pieces that contribute to these various uh, impact categories. For instance, global warming potential. It'll pick out all of the methane streams and uh, carbon streams and nitrous oxide and um, sulfur dioxide streams and from all of the different flows of the system and add them together and normalize that to tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. The same thing for the rest of them. We have acidification, ecotoxicity, eutrophication, freshwater eutrophication, and then non-carcinogens and respiratory effects really are um, related to human health. So once Tracy uh, combines all these and normalizes them, I have this ranked one being the highest so the highest overall amount of impact, and then six or seven, sorry, being the lowest. I have relative in here with just these values and no numbers for a couple reasons. One, um, this is all normalized to a functional unit of one ton of waste. So the numbers ended up actually being quite small. Um, and when you're looking at 0. .0000 something on, you know, scaled across seven columns, it's a little bit hard to see, but also more importantly, the point of this is that it's not to determine which one's best or which one's worst. So you wouldn't say, oh, well, obviously, if one is bad and that one has the most ones, 
clearly we wouldn't choose that technology. That's not the point. The point is to look at them relatively, um, or relative to one another, and to look at the trade-offs and the interactions at different points in each process. Um, so that's why I just had some relative numbers. So given those relative numbers and all the other um, services and impacts that I talked about, how do we go about integrating these values, um, or any value, into uh, another assessment? So for instance, these are all a lot of environmental impacts, but they're numbers. And how do we take those numbers and, and translate them into dollars or another appropriate um, form of measurement? especially when there are, even within the scenarios that I just suggested, there are differences in emissions and other environmental impacts. There's differences in waste stream concentrations. Um, additions of new technologies would absolutely change the, uh, the stream of waste and the composition of it. Um, biogas capture and transformation, that really just depends on what type of digester, how you're operating it. So those are a lot of parameters. Um, materials and energy inputs and outputs, and then Site-specific needs are really important. I, I showed the nitrogen up there, but what I didn't, and I also mentioned that this was a special farm where they were able to utilize a lot of the stuff that they produced on the farm. But that's really not the case for a lot of North Carolina farms, and so what do you do when you have all of this potential uh, revenue stream or this potential product that you want to utilize where you put it? So before I start the economic part, if there's any questions on that part, I would be happy to answer them. I have uh, two questions. <coughs> so the existing farm that's the data source, mm -hmm. did it have actually a flushing system and a scraping system, or you just added the other uh, to build the model? It actually has a scraper system. Mm -hmm. They were traditionally flush system. Oh. They, yeah, they have both. Yeah, they were they retrofitted some of their barns with scrapers, and so we had both data sources. But also, um, I guess maybe I should have mentioned it's a Murphy Brown farm, Murphy Brown um, Sears Stepfield, and so we have other farms that use different technology, digesters, um, and some other systems near enough nearby to take data from them as well and compare. Second question was on the impact category eutrophication. Mm -hmm. It was a kilograms of nitrogen. Does that mean there was no phosphorus input? No. So the impact categories, and there are dozens that you can choose. The only reason I chose the Tracy was because it's one of the only ones specific to site specific to the United States for impact. Um, the kilograms of nitrogen, some other <coughs> programs use kilograms of, could use kilograms of phosphorus. They have different metrics. This one just particularly uses kilograms of nitrogen. So if there is another source that contributes to eutrophication, it would just be converted to equivalent to nitrogen in that. Yes. <laughs> in, in your gate-to-gate -gate assessment, how do you account for fees? You may have mentioned it, but I didn't quite catch it. So in the gate-to-gate -gate assessment, um, fee is actually not included, or at least production of feed. Production of feed is not included, normally because feed um, being given to the pigs would be an on-farm process, but because this is um, a pretty strict operating um, farm, from farm to farm, um, they have pretty similar management practices. We just assumed that for this farm, whatever the inputs were would be similar. Um, I do actually have, that's going to be included um, in further scenarios when you do include the impact of, of changes has to be on the waste streams, but that wasn't, it was assumed that everything operating in the barn, as far as water, um, for watering the animals, feeding the animals, the barn itself, the capacity, were similar across all scenarios. Um, you showed the, the graph of nitrogen capture and the base lightning. Could we, could we just quickly go back to that? Um, in, in my head, uh, like there are losses of nitrogen relative to the amount that's available. You're saying 95 tons is the sort of amount that's available in the manure. Is From all right? animals over the course of the year. Yep. Um, yep. So in my head, if you're capturing nitrogen, then shouldn't you just be getting a percentage towards 95 tons a year? 
And then all these ones are showing numbers above that, and I'm going, where's the nitrogen coming from? Right, so these are, this is gross nitrogen, or in addition to, after the transformations from each process, it's like an additive, oh, I see what you're saying. So because the 95, it would only be something above 95, yeah, like but the so baseline here. If I, had a, if I had a nutrient recovery system that recovered 90% of the nitrogen, then my bar graph should say 90% of 95 and whatever the baseline should be, whatever is biologically available, I assume in the irrigated effluent onto the land. Am I, is that, is that, is that right or? It, I understand what you're saying and it makes sense. Um, so the way this is graphed is that we actually had, we took laboratory analysis data from different and literature data from inputs and outputs to each process from the barn into storage, from storage, into digester, from digester, out of digester, and along that line, um, whatever came out of the lagoon was based on whatever the treatment, the concentration of nitrogen, the total nitrogen um, coming out of the previous system. Not really accounting for a lot of losses. In the baseline scenario, that's why it is lower. I mean, I'm sorry, in F1, which represents the baseline, it is lower, and that does reflect the losses from the volatilization. In the other ones, it's based on just a mass balance, so maybe it's not, maybe the way I have it um, graphed isn't representing, like you said, the difference between the baseline and the total amount from emissions. Um, and not, emissions were, included in this, uh, ammonia emissions especially, and nitrogen emissions, but really it's more of a, a mass balance, like a snapshot of each total from each stage, based on laboratory analysis data, and the number of animals and the flow rate. So I think we need to move on, it was already 10 minutes in your second Oh, okay. Slide. All right, thank you. Okay. Oops. All right, so coming back to this, okay, now we have a relative amount and we have some nitrogen on some graphs and some biogas. Well, we're still back at this problem of determining what the value and worth of all of that is. So very simple economic equation, probably most of us know. Revenue uh, or value is quantity times price. And as an example, um, we can use CO2 reduction value. Um, this was taken from the EPA's website. They have a released a report in the last year or two on the social cost of carbon, or a dollar, val dollar value associated with a, a one ton reduction of carbon, and it's actually a metric ton, but I converted it to um, short tons, um, or the benefit associated with avoided emissions of carbon. So they have three values, um, $13 a ton, $46 a ton, and $75 a ton. And this is based on projected 2020 values at various interest rates. Okay, first of all, there's a pretty big disparity between those numbers uh, for the same year. Okay, so let's just take as an example the offset carbon from elect avoided electricity production or renewable electricity that we had from our baseline scenario, the lowest one. Uh, was 578 tons of avoided uh, equivalents of carbon dioxide. Well, based on the 13 to 75, we have $7,300, it's not bad, or $43,000, that's really not bad. But the point of this is that we still don't know. We have three different values, these are just estimates, and there's a lot of other figures out there, scientifically based, that widely vary. So what do you do if you don't know what the real price is? And worse, what if you don't know if the actual quantities are even valid and you don't know what the price is? So uh, for our economic analysis, we took the outputs from the LC open LCA and other uh, input them into numerous models. And I want to emphasize models because there's no one model and even no one or two models that are accurately uh, able or even efficiently able to capture all of these complexities uh, in these systems. We use partial budgeting worksheet to uh, calculate some of the capital and operating expenses over the, um, over the year for the farm. We use a nutrient recovery model to calculate maybe the value and the quantity of the nitrogen derived from the ammonia recovery system. 
a biogas model for the entire digester system, uh, an EPA model, and then other models. And so, um, looking back at that original biogas production and electricity generation potential, if you assign some dollars to that, um, and these are based on the California up until two weeks ago, I don't know what the price is today, but the um, current trading value of carbon credits on the California exchange, or market, uh, and then electricity price of eight to 10 cents per kilowatt hour, which is pretty typical of North Carolina prices. Um, then you see that this is the potential revenue. Potential, I say, because this doesn't include a lot of the other, um, it does include capital and operating costs, but um, as far as electricity goes, you have to be able to put that electricity somewhere if you're not gonna use it on the farm, and there are some barriers here in North Carolina to be able to outlet that, or to obtain that revenue. So for the fertilizer, again, this is just an estimated value based on the total amount of nitrogen. Obviously, especially for the scenario F1 here, that would really just be an avoided cost. It's not an additional revenue that's probably gonna be used on the farm. But just to put it comparatively in dollar terms for what you might get if you were to take all that nitrogen and sell it, again, that's, this is gross, not net, which you would use on the farm, just a comparison um, based on the addition of these technologies. So the system cost comparison, if you're looking at the, all of these modeling um, systems that I use to come up with these numbers, you have the baseline operating cost, and this is just um, based on the partial budgeting worksheet. That's the same for all of them, assuming business as usual. You have baseline revenue, and that's really just um, sort of representing the sale of the animals um, and any other additional revenue um, as a baseline. <coughs> additional costs incurred, that uh, reflects the installation of the digester and or nutrient recovery technology. Additional revenue gained is strictly just the electricity or potential carbon credits that they could get. Um, and so the total cost and total revenues are reflected um, as the combination of those. So you can see that at least one, two, three, four, five scenarios look like the total revenues you know, greater than the total cost, and that seems promising. However, um, if you just look at the digester and the additional capital costs and operating costs of the digester and then consider the break-even or required electricity price to make that reasonable or feasible um, for adoption, you have 50 cents, 17 cents, and 26 cents per kilowatt hour, which I don't know how much people get elsewhere for electricity, but we definitely don't get that here. So that's just something to consider um, in, in future scenarios and in adoption in general. So the policy implications are, this is sort of the next phase. We still don't know the extent to which federal and state policy uh, affect positively or negatively these options for market entry or building markets that maybe don't exist yet uh, and making them accessible. So um, regulation in the absence of markets, so when there aren't markets, how does regulation, how is regulation formed and how does that, who's forming it? How is how is it formed, and then how does that affect you know, farm operations and then larger industry operations? And then uh, co cohesive federal and state policies. So a lot of literature um, into, specifically into um, adoption of alternative technologies in North Carolina and elsewhere have really cited that the <coughs> federal and state policies, and probably I don't even need to tell most of you this, um, largely don't coexist in a, um, a way that is uh, supports adoption of these technologies or market entry or um, other benefits. And they, lar a large part of this is because they're segmented. They're not cohesive. Um, sometimes they overlap, sometimes they don't, sometimes they contradict themselves. And so that's really um, an additional limitation uh, or something to address in the future. So future project goals, um, obviously to find, find the right criteria and figure out uh, how to, if, oh, sorry, finding the right criteria to evaluate these systems and then finding the best combinations of systems to really um, bring value to, to the farmers and ultimately um, support the industry. And that's gonna involve uh, comprehensive measures 
the effects of these alternative technologies on farms, on um, larger systems, and then prices, of course, derived from these traditional and novel markets, uh, prices um, and availability. So I think I already probably went through some of this, but there's, there's no right way to evaluate um, complex systems and there's no right model. But there are some wrong ones, and the wrong ones simply mean that it's not in the way that you, it's not the model you choose, it's the way you think about the system that you're evaluating, and that's really important. If you go into it with um, a specific goal, that's fine, but you really need to understand the, the overall consequences and interactions and, and stakeholders that are involved uh, in, the, um, in the modeling process and in the outcomes and what those implications are. All are welcome uh, and necessary. That again goes back to stakeholders and I think was reiterated quite a few times during this conference that you really need as many people along the line as possible in these discussions. And that includes consumers, that includes you know, farmers, that includes researchers and all sorts of people. That's necessary and that goes back to um, the way the model's built. It will probably be built in a comprehensive way that accommodates social, economic, and environmental aspects if you bring more people with more perspectives. And then data quality and assumptions. Um, in modeling in general, and just any sort of uh, simulations, or even just in real life, if you are going to simulate the real world, which is what models do, then you have to have some sort of basis for what your data is and what your assumptions are. and um, that's really important to consider at the initial step. And then I think I already mentioned this a bit, but um, ultimately the point is that being able to accurately identify this, um, identify the value and the worth in these systems, not just the price, um, will ultimately be a better decision, um, or help farmers make decisions, or assist them at least, um, and support them. And so, um, yeah, it should be comprehensive. It should include social, environmental, and economic um, consequences, impacts, trade-offs, and then um, additional methods, models, and frameworks should always be considered. Like I said, there's no one right model. Um, there's no specifically wrong model, but you really should look at your options and choose from that and see what best fits your, your scenario or your um, your simulations or what it is you're trying to do. So, oh, acknowledgement, CSGA and um, Smithfield Hub Production for our research. And thank you. I have time for one question. John? Uh, no. Over here, Christine? No. I did, and actually renewable energy credits, um, and actually on the policy end, we're gonna look at maybe some carbon cap, or carbon trading, carbon caps, different um, different policies that affect renewable energy. Renewable energy credits was one that we looked at. Um, we are gonna include it, but we didn't here. Um, and there's also a little bit of um, issues as far as me trying to find some valid data specifically related to the scenarios that I'm doing and renewable energy credits. I feel like in North Carolina, a lot of um, renewable energy credits are, there's a lot of literature about, ooh, solar, you know, which is great. Um, and the solar industry, is, I think, in North Carolina is really taken to the renewable energy credit. But as far as um, swine producers as much trying to get the renewable energy credit, <coughs> I haven't been able to find as much information, especially information specific to like what I'm trying to model. So oh, that. Not That's probably why I've had a hard time. Yeah, <laughs> but I am gonna. That is something that we're considering as another um, form of revenue. All right. Let's thank Shannon again.